All right, everybody, this is Ross. Welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. Uh, I hope everybody had a nice Thanksgiving. I hope everybody's uh, out there staying healthy and happy and you guys are just being good people and all that stuff. Um, in tonight's episode of Fruit Talk, we're going to mention, um, actually finalize our plans here with the citrus trees. We talked about that a little bit last week. So I'm going to talk about the varieties I'm going to go with. Um, because now that I have all this room on the patio, um, I have a lot more room for potted trees and can't think of a, a better potted tree to have, in my opinion, than the citrus tree. Really, it's one of the best. So we have a couple varieties I'm going to mention, some experimental varieties I'm going to mention, things I'm looking for, what my plans are with that. We're also going to talk about um, some strawberry beds that we're going to dedicate our time to. So we're creating two beds, and those strawberry beds are going to take up actually quite a bit of land, but it's going to be all worth it. And I want to, I think we did touch on last week how it's all going to work with the fact that it is a raised bed, although it's not the highest raised bed, it is going to be raised. And then on the top of the raised bed is actually going to be a hinge, and you can lift that up, and it will actually have some bird netting on it so that none of the creatures and critters and you know, different things can get in there and mess with the bed. I'm probably going to have to worry about slugs, so maybe I should figure out something for the slugs. Maybe I should get even a finer, maybe I'll go with a finer material, actually, now that I think about it. But the point is, is that we're going to have these uh, these strawberry plants in a, just a, a more, uh, more of a bigger focal point, let's say, uh, in the yard, because... Just where they're at right now, they're getting kind of um, swallowed up. You know, things are not really going their way. There's been a, a lot of things that have sort of uh, impeded them this last year specifically. So we'll talk about the strawberries a little bit and the varieties that we're going to go with and our plans with that. And then that really does lead us into our garden plans for 2021. And we're going to talk about the summer garden, the spring garden, the fall garden, even the garden um, at the community garden, uh, because we are going to really stick with that. We are going to do that because what I really would like to do is use all that extra space to grow all these different things that either I did grow last year or um, we just don't have a whole lot of room for. You know, those community garden plots are about 30 by 30. Um, it's a lot more garden space than I have. So, you know, it's a really big benefit and to, to be able to separate this out and say, hey, you know, let's grow the stuff that takes up a lot more space or the stuff that doesn't need a whole lot of attention. We'll throw that over there. And then all the stuff that needs more attention, more care will grow here. So let's start out, like I said, with the citrus trees. Now, I'm just, I guess, a fool because in the beginning when I started growing citrus trees, I remember I think I went to stark brothers nursery and i think i ordered myself maybe three or four citrus trees let me see what varieties they even have because this will really jog my memory so i think i ordered a meyer lemon a tangerine and i ordered a calamondin yeah calamondin orange so i may have and i may have even picked up a, a lime if i'm not mistaken um, I think I even picked up a key lime. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you, but I know I had about three or four, and I know that I even ripened, actually, some calamondin oranges, realized I didn't like them, and then got rid of them, and got rid of all the citrus, I think. I think a couple of the citrus weren't doing well, and I I don't even know what was going through my head at the time, which is funny, because uh, you know, looking at this list, they're not really the best varieties, but... In terms of the Kalamundan orange, I'm actually coming back to the Kalamundan orange, which is one of the few standard, really, varieties of citrus trees that I think work really well in pots, number one, and have a, a good amount of uses to them. Um, so the Kalamundan, even though I guess we're calling it an orange, I think it's actually technically a kumquat, and maybe that's really the proper name. But uh, the Kalamundan kumquat, let's say, uh, as they say here on Four Winds, by the way, this is really where I recommend you guys get them. These are Four Winds, uh, you know, One Green World is good. And if you're in, um, 
Florida, definitely go with just fruits and exotics. But certainly the the Calamundin has a number of uses. It's really good uh, in terms of its juice. They say you can use it like a lime, but also it, it is like a kumquat. So you kind of just eat them whole. And I'm, you know, not really knowledgeable at the time or, and didn't know what I was doing. Pretty sure I tried to um, just peel the Calamundin and eat it like like you would an orange and not understanding any of this at the time. That's probably why I got rid of it just because of how bad it was just without the peel. But you know, you obviously would eat it with the peel, but I think more specifically my two main goals with citrus going forward are going to be for one making marmalade. So something specifically to make marmalade, which actually the Calamundin orange is, or the Calamundin kumquat, whatever you want to call it, is really one of the best for a marmalade. Um, and then the other thing I'm interested in is actually making at some point some lemon cello, just to see how that works out and how that turns out. Um, and then of course to have all these different pieces of citrus that you can eat fresh or use in cooking. We'll get to that in a minute, but the Calamundin through my research, I was really trying to find a variety of citrus that would make a really reliable and good marmalade. And the Calamundin just kept popping up as one of the best choices. I think another really good choice is actually the Improves Meyer Lemon. You can obviously make, I don't even know technically if you could consider them a marmalade, but I've seen some tangerine, I guess, jams. Are, are they a jam or is it a marmalade? I don't know. What is the difference? I don't know either. Uh, I think marmalades, I guess, have the peel within them. I, I really don't know. Maybe the texture is, I think, obviously different. And of course, the right, the acidity in the in the jam or marmalade is quite different, right? These are a nice balance of sweet, a nice balance of tart. Um, so I don't, I don't exactly know w really how this is all going to work, but I love making jam. And I would love to make some sort of marmalade to have for anything, any purpose. Uh, it seems like a really fantastic product that I think a lot of people overlook, honestly, um, in terms of your your food. So this one, I obviously, I think was just it's just a great choice because it's it's not really totally sour. The peel gives it a nice sweetness, but it also has got good flavor. So you kind of, in a way can use it like a Meyer lemon, right? The Meyer lemon is, is like a, a sweeter version of a lemon. It's not as acidic. So it's not as great for like cooking purposes. You might want to use that for something like lemonade or something like that. Um, you know, a Meyer lemon, but it, it, it would make a pretty darn good marmalade. Um, at least I would think, right? I, <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking like I know from experience, but, um, you know, I certainly have read that uh, from other people, from other growers. So um, those were two that just kept popping up. And instead of getting a Meyer lemon, I, I decided to go with this because I just felt like this for me has more uses. But I may end up caving and just getting myself an improved Meyer lemon because it's such a good variety actually to grow. A lot of people grow it. It's very reliable. You know, I think with both of them, you get a lot of fruit. They're really good container plants. So I'm not entirely sold on either one of them, I guess, or not sold on either one of them. I, You know, maybe I'll end up growing both. And I think what I'm going to do this year, because I have a variety of, uh, of citrus here called the Eustace Lime Quat. This is it right here. And I ordered this, I think, two years ago from Four Winds. And I ordered a couple of varieties. I ordered this, the Fukushu Kumquat, and an Australian Finger Lime. Just to recap all three of them, um, the Australian Finger Lime, actually all three of them really had a bad case of scale as they normally get attacked by something indoors throughout the wintertime. They're there for so long that you would just end up really, they end up struggling. And what I ended up doing was leaving them outside um, in the spring, put them, you know, just move them outside. And then the ladybugs came in and just decimated all of the, the uh, scale. It was kind of insane. 
they really just took over and the scale problem was gone very, very quickly. So I was um, really happy to see that. And then as soon as that was gone, they recovered very quickly. And then they grew like mad because I actually was feeding them like an insane amount of food, whether that's in the soil or even just the foliar sprays, which we'll talk about later as well. But the Dynagro Protect and the, the Foliage Pro, I was just nonstop spraying that stuff every week every other week for most of the season and they just took off from that point and of course they had a pretty well established root system they have great soil you know it's not like they were rotting the whole winter time like some of these citrus trees can do so they they really for the most part i think had a successful year and it may it really paid off the um the eustis lime quat here put out a uh, you know, a handful of fruits. In fact, it's has them on them right now and it, it's probably going to ripen them in the next month, maybe even sooner than that. I probably could pick some of them right now. Um, so those are, you know, because it had so much fruit on it, I think early in this, this spring season, it didn't grow all that much this year. And that, that is, um, my only real explanation, but the other two trees, the Australian finger lime, I mean, that thing like tripled, maybe even quadrupled in size. It's huge. Uh, it did flower twice, although it, it didn't hold on to the flowers because um, it, the first set of flowers, which was way more profuse, profusely, that's, I don't, I don't know, guys, English is hard. But the point is, is that <laughs> the, the flowers um, kind of, of course, lay, aligned really well with the scale, and it just didn't work out for whatever reason. It did flower again, which I was very surprised to see. And then I don't know what happened there exactly, but uh, it, it's just, you know, too late in the year at that point or something. Something didn't go right. And I'm not too worried about it because next year it'll be fine. And then the the uh, Fukushi Kumquat actually was the biggest winner of them all. It's huge. It's way bigger than the other two trees. It has 40 fruits on it. And they're not even really that far away from being ripe. So really an incredible tree, an incredible variety. That's what this is all about. I mean, I'm going to be able to really talk about that tree this wintertime at some point. And I could make a marmalade out of that. Um, obviously, the Fukushu is a good one to eat fresh. So I'm going to be eating them fresh. And then on top of that, we have some of the Eustace line quats that are going to re-ripe. And... I've been overall very disappointed by this particular variety, um, mainly because what I really was looking for was something with a lot of versatility to it. And I, if you guys remember me talking about this, I, we may have even mentioned this in an episode of Fruit Talk, I think. I was going to go with this particular variety because of its versatility and the fact that it's a cross between a kumquat and a lime. So I thought it was going to taste a lot like a lime, I was going to be able to use it in cooking like a lime, um, but also be able to eat it fresh if I wanted to, like a kumquat. Neither of which seems like a good idea. In fact, it it actually, to me, reminds me a lot more of a, a lemon than a lime. It's such a strange piece of fruit, fruit that I don't really know where to place it or what to do with it. My next actual thought is that maybe it could make a good marmalade. So... My plan was actually to graft onto this either a finger lime or one of the kumquats and just say, you know, forget about this tree and move on. Um, but it may end up proving itself useful in some way. I don't know. We're going to have to test it in a couple ways and see really what the deal is. But overall, as I said, I was really not impressed with this. And I think this was a good lesson because really what's – I'm doing now is really what I should have done years ago, which is the other two trees I'm really going to go for this year is actually the, the bear's lime and the Lisbon lemon. So here's the, the bear's lime. This is your standard lime variety. You know, the Persian or the Tahitian limes are really good for giving you that strong lime flavor. Um, they really have that classic cooking flavor that you're looking for you know there's the other type here i think it's the the kefir lime that 
you could also use for cooking, but that's more, li more about the leaves. Here it is right here. There's also the, uh, the key lime, which is mainly used for pies and things like that. Um, yuzu, which is used mostly in like, in like drinks and things like that. So I thought this was really the best choice I had was the bear seedless lime, because this is really the most standard variety for this particular purpose. Um, it also just seems very reliable, reasonable. Really, it's the standard. So we're going to go with that. Nothing real too special about it. And then, of course, we went with the uh, the Lisbon lemon. And it's the same thing with the lemon, is that you could get a little crazy with this, a little weird with this, and get a, you know, an improves Meyer or something. But again, I think you, if you want something that's standard, it's going to have that really awesome lemon flavor for your cooking, which is really what I wanted. You got to go with something like Eureka, Lisbon, Ponderosa. There's even some lemons, like the New Zealand lemonade tree. You eat them. They're a little sweet, like a Meyer, but they really do taste like lemonade, apparently. There's some you can use for tea. I think it's the bergamot citrus, which is re really for the tea. Um, but, you know, through all my research of these lemons and different things, I just figured out that it's better to go with a standard, find myself a lemon that's going to get me that replacement for having to go to the store and buy lemons and buy limes and just, you know, have them on my own tree at home. And if I wanted to make some, um, you know, lemoncello or something, uh, maybe I can go out and buy a couple lemons, but you know, that's the, that's the deal is that I'm going to have a nice supply of these, uh, these citrus anytime I want. Now the improved Meyer, um, Again, it could be another nice option for me. And I'm going to, I guess, make a decision here at some point. Uh, we'll see what I what I go with and how crazy I get. But I have two varieties here that are quite experimental that I think are really well worth my time. This is one here called the Excalibur Red Lime. And this is one that I was hoping that the Eustace Lime Quat would be. Because the Eustace, I thought, was going to fill... A number of different categories and can use use it for a number of different uses again i haven't found that to be true just yet but the excalibur red lime is really it's on lime and you can use it like a lime it's supposed to be very tasty i heard um i in fact i've heard this actually i asked the nursery a couple questions and i even found some uh great information from people growing this particular lime um, saying that basically it's it's just got multiple uses in that it could be used as a lime or it can be used as a kumquat because in the parentage is a kumquat and a lime. So that's really where this thing gets, I think, a bit more interesting and maybe could fill a particular gap for me. Maybe this one could be used in a marmalade as well. Maybe I would like this one a lot in terms of eating it fresh. Maybe I'm just you know, out of options here and I'm using it like a lime in the kitchen. What really I thought was interesting about it is that it's ever bearing um, and that you have year round fruit. So that to me is a really, really great sign. Um, I really appreciate that about any of these citrus varieties is that I went with the Lisbon lemon because that one seemed to me to be the most reliable all year um, and relatively just I guess the easiest to grow um, and I think that's maybe where Excalibur could shine maybe I'm getting a little carried away with this one as well but some of the reviews I read on this were phenomenal um, and then the last one we actually talked about this last week was the Amoa 8 blood orange and this is it's just too good to pass up and you know growing sweet citrus here is very difficult because it just doesn't get sweet. So um, the challenge, I think, is going to be to see if that'll even work. If it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. I'm not going to get rid of it because at some point, I'll be able to grow these citrus trees in the ground. And I won't have to worry about um, having enough chill or the, the right winter conditions uh, for these particular pieces of citrus. This will just be one that I think you can add to the collection and... Uh, will be amazing to have, you know, forever, I hope.
So that's uh that's my little citrus here thing, my citrus thing here, guys. Um, let's move on to the strawberries. As I mentioned, we're dedicating two areas. Uh, one is going to be filled with Mara de Bois, and uh, I do have plenty of plants that I could, and I'm going to transplant as many as I can. But I think it's better, I think if I can get a set of 25, because it is a large area, I think it might just pay off. And, you know, you, you buy these strawberries like the Mara de Bois, it's going to pay off that season. The Rucker strawberry is going to be the other bed, which is going to be mainly filled with high quality or experimental June bearing strawberries like the purple wonder obviously the Rucker scarlet and then anything else I guess if I want to trial something um really a big fan of the Rucker scarlet and I don't need two of the beds I think for ever bearing types it's just better this way if you can pick them um you know once once a year and then forget about them I think if uh you can neglect them in that sense you're just way better off. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, so the let me show you now the areas of these particular beds. So here's our garden plants. They're gonna really just take up some of the garden. Is really just what I've decided. Is um, you know, there's really no other way around it. I think maybe I don't need all this room. Uh, maybe I'll at some point decide against this and just go with one of the beds this one here uh the rucker scarlet and the june bearing bed this is going to be a part of the spring the spring beds and the fall beds whereas the mara de bois i have here in the summer garden um on the south side of the property now the mara de bois this one i think is 10 by 3 which is 30 square feet and then the rucker scarlet bed actually is 36 square feet so that's a lot of room for strawberries, and I don't know really if I need all that. Um, so I may decide, like I said, against one or the other. Probably if I was going to change my mind, I would take out the one here that's encroaching into the summer bed, but uh, we'll see. I have to build a raised bed. That's the goal here. And then it doesn't have to be very high. It's probably going to be like four inches off the ground, uh, fill in the soil. And then on top of it is a hinge, which will basically have the wood, another layer of the wood on it, a thin layer, and then attached to that hinge is going to be, you know, like a net, a bird net, or some other finer material just to keep out the birds, the groundhogs, the skunks, the squirrels. Every critter loves the strawberry. And then uh, also maybe even something to keep out the slugs. If I can get that, maybe that thing, you know, skin tight, it probably would be the best if I can build. If I can actually build a box properly, um, <laughs> and get it nice and firm uh, with no gaps in it, um, then I guess the the slugs can't get in either. But uh, who knows if that's even possible for me? <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so let's talk now about the uh, the garden plans for 2021. Um, I think ideally what's going to happen here in the spring the spring beds and the fall beds, because these are all basically the same. It's just really, you know, you plant some at different times. Like you plant some in, um, you know, March versus planting some in, in July. And then it's pretty much the same crops. Very few differences here and there. But we're going to grow all the cool loving crops here once again. Except for some of the brassicas, I think, because these brassicas, one, are very difficult to grow, but two, they just do so much better in, obviously, more fertile soil. So if I am going to grow them, I need to beef up the soil a bit more, but also put them somewhere, I think, just in full sun. I mean, there's just no way around it at this point. I think I've tried my best to... Uh, certainly get away with it over here and I, and I can get away with it over here just everything has to be perfect and if everything's not perfect I'm I mean it's kind of like that no matter where you grow them because just they're so difficult to grow in this climate but things like broccoli and and uh and brussels sprouts and cabbages are just they really are a challenge um 
So giving them all the help they can get, I think would be way better off than, you know, trying to do this, you know, in a very high dense way. I probably should just give them a little bit more space, a little bit more light, call it a day. But the rest of this, certainly I'm going to be growing things like a lot of the peas uh, as we do every year. Um, a lot of the lettuces, definitely arugula, some chard, some beets, carrots, a lot of the root crops, other brassicas that may not need a whole lot of uh, space or commitment to them, like some broccoli rob or um, maybe some kohlrabi. Um, you know, different things that are just not as demanding, I think, as the broccoli, the cabbages, the Brussels sprouts. Um, we'll probably grow some cilantro in here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of different things, guys. If we just go through some of these seed catalogs here, uh, I'm sure we can find some ideas of what we're doing for next year. I haven't even bought seeds yet, which, so when we finalize this, I'm going to buy a whole bunch of seeds. Um, because I'm actually pretty, I'm pretty much out of seed. Like I used a lot of seed this year. Let's see. Um, we're gonna do we're gonna do fava beans as well. So I'm gonna put that in here. I totally forgot about this. I may even do a whole row of fava beans. This is gonna be my big experiment for the year. I actually had an opportunity to. I just commented on Charles Dowding's post um, on Instagram, and I asked him because he was planting his fava beans now, I believe. Yeah, he planted them a while ago, actually, and he overwinters them because if you get, I think it's down to 15 or 20 degrees Fahrenheit, they'll get through the winter. They won't here. And I asked him, hey, Charles, you know, what if I planted them out the 1st of March? Would I still have success? And he said, certainly. So... That's what we're going to do. And I love fava beans. Uh, I think we can roast them, um, season them. Um, and those are really, really great snacks. One of my favorites, uh, believe it or not. So we're going to do that. Uh, what else we got over here that is really worth growing in this space? We mentioned arugula. Now, I guess I could do some beans over there, maybe one crop of beans, maybe sometime during the summer. We mentioned the beets, um, maybe a couple Asian greens, some bok choy in the summer, uh, you know, definitely a lot of carrots. I have a ton of carrots already in there. Um, what else, what else, what else? The endive came out really well. This year, oh fennel for sure. I'm gonna grow a ton of fennel. That's one that I'm dead. I'm gonna dedicate a ton of space to um, as well. Maybe this. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five. Let's do ten. Let's do that. Let's do ten boxes of fennel. You just I, my my opinion. You can't have enough fennel. Um, I use that stuff a lot. Um, I cook with that really quite often. Um, now we'll have a whole area here. This is going to be mostly peas. Uh, we can dedicate at least half of this to, to, uh, peas. And this is going to be the sugar snap pea, by the way. And that's the variety. Uh, what is, what is the variety guys that I grow? I'm sure someone knows out there. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just done so well for me. I, I wonder if I could grow a different variety actually that gets a bit taller and it might just be more productive. I mean, this, this particular variety is so small that, hmm, I have to recall what my issues were last year because we had, this was the, actually really the best year I had for the peas, but I think I planted them a little too dense on some of them. And there are some varieties I've seen that you can trellis them up 
And instead of putting them in the cold frame right here, because that's where this is, this is the cold frame, I'll put them out here, maybe out in the open, and uh, and trellis them. But we're definitely going to do plenty of beats. I'm pro I may even start the beats and transplant them in. Um, beats plus we got carrots. And then all in this really is going to be things like, yeah, this this is going to be arugula. Did he say arugula? I don't even know. Yeah, this is there's too many U's in there. And then uh, let's see. We have to put in our chard, but I think the chard is actually going to be scattered somewhere out in the, you know, throughout the yard. I have, I let my chard go to seed this year, and there is seed everywhere. So I imagine I'm just going to have chard coming up every which way, and that's my plan is to actually just to have a ton of it to to juice it and things like that. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Leaks, 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 leaks. We should try leaks this year, but I'm not too certain I want to. Yeah, we're not we're not gonna do leaks. And the reason for that is because I got the elephant garlic. That is supposed to be a really good uh leak replacement. And it's sort of a lot easier to grow. Uh and they're doing great. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Mustard. I may grow some mustard. I know my friend Chris is obsessed with a certain type of mustard. Um, Mizuna is great in the summer. Uh, we'll do the radishes again this year. I think I'll do radishes, the French breakfast radishes, instead of the turnips. I think I like the radishes more. Yeah, so that is that is roughly it here, guys, for the spring and the fall beds. So we'll do a thing of radish. Don't need a ton of them. Maybe two two boxes worth. Um, and I think that's roughly it for the for this garden. We have a row of cilantro. Can't forget about that. And I think that is roughly it here, guys. Um, all right, so then let's move on to this the summer garden because this is where the summer garden gets quite interesting. Now, the summer garden is going to be very much so about things that need a lot of attention. Um. And yeah, just basically things that need a ton of attention or a lot less room. Yeah, that's, that was the other point I wanted to make. Because in this, the community garden is 30 by 30. And I've decided we're going to grow corn once again. But the corn takes up a ton of room. And really, it does need a lot of attention. It needs a lot of water. It needs a lot, a lot of food. So unfortunately, I think we're just going to have to deal with it. Whatever we get, we get, and I'll just plant a lot of corn. Um, I hope I don't regret that, and I hope I have some sort of success. Maybe I'll come in there every time I'm there is just make a point to water it, um, feed it as much as I can. I mean, that's really the best I can do. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to feed it some way. Maybe I'll give it some kind of slow release or something. But, yeah, at this community garden... These things here, it's obviously a lot more room, but I just don't have enough um, room to grow them at the house. And obviously, some of them may need more attention than I'd like. And some of the things that don't need a whole lot of attention is really the zucchinis. We're going to try to grow, again, either a scallop or the, the cue ball one, something we can stuff the zucchini. 
Uh, we're going to grow a lot of beans here. So things like soybeans and, you know, um, beans for shelling and storing. I may even grow some potatoes here next year, um, onions next year. So we're going to have rows of, definitely rows of potatoes, onions, all kinds of beans, noodle beans, uh, you know, long beans, just every bean you can think of. But I really want even string beans, you know, French beans, and, and just really, again, like every every little bean. Uh, the Adacha shield bean here is another one that you could grow up the corn, but it didn't really work out. Uh, mainly because of when I planted it. I just did not plant it soon enough. The corn took off a lot quicker than I thought it would. And therefore, the beans never caught up. And I didn't get a whole lot from those beans. But that's a possibility as well. Um, I think we're going to have to figure out the bean situation, figure out this whole thing. What I don't want to do, I think, is plant cucumbers here. Because we're going to go back to the, the house, and we're going to plant cucumbers in at the house and the reason for that is they need a whole lot of attention so um they, they're just one of them things here guys that unfortunately um you know if they get that fusarium wilt and then they start spreading that to other things it's over for me so we're going to focus again in, in this whole plot here is really going to be tomatoes melons, cucumbers, eggplant, and peppers. And that's it. These these things need more attention, more care, more everything. Um, you know, in terms of the eggplants, the Jimmy and the peppers, these are really fantastic varieties. Swallow eggplant, Jimmy Nardello pepper. They do so well in my short season climate. They produce a ton of fruit. But they need a longer season. I actually dug them up. We're overwintering them. I can plant them back out in the spring, which is going to be great. Um, but they do need a raised bed. And you need to give them those warmer soil temperatures. I do need to give them a head start. They are going to be underneath the low tunnels. So that's just what we're doing with them. Um, they just need that particular, I think, really they need to be grown somewhere other than where I'm at. But, but if we're going to grow them here. I need to give them the best shot I can. Uh, the tomatoes, obviously, we can get away with them, uh, growing them in other places. Maybe I can even plant some of the tomatoes at the community garden as well, depending on how much room we have. We still have to rearrange all of this, figure all of this out. But what I know for sure is that the melons are going to go here. They need a ton of attention. I need to be feeding them. I need to be... Um, Really pay, looking after them because of that Fusarium will. We probably will do some grafting this year because I really want to find varieties that are just super sweet. And that's the main thing I'm looking for because if they're not super sweet, they ain't going to be that good. And I think also the way that we're growing them vertically is really going to help J them just have the right photosynthesis to produce those carbohydrates. We talked about this a lot um, in other episodes, but. That, I think, is really key. Now, the cucumbers could really mess this whole thing up. So if I have the cucumbers, I have the melons, I got to spray them all anyway. Got to give them the Dynagrow Protect that keeps the cucumber beetle away at bay. It doesn't let them multiply. It doesn't let them do their thing. And it doesn't really become an issue. So I'm almost thinking I could be fine without grafting, but I think I'm just going to graft, bite the bullet. We have a whole lot of room in the greenhouse for our seeds, so... I'm not necessarily too worried about grafting and experimenting with that. We just have to really pay attention to it, and that'll be it, right? So, um, yeah, very excited to do all this, honestly. Um, the only thing left really is to get all this in, in perfect order of every variety I want to grow and accumulate the varieties I want. You know, depending on how many melon varieties I get, that's how much space I'm going to dedicate to the melons. Uh, we're growing them mostly vertically. So along this side here is a trellis I've already built. Need to beef it up a little bit. Along that trellis, I probably will do the cucumbers, uh, believe it or not. So I'm going to do something like that. And we'll put the, the 
text down like this, and this will be cucumber. And we'll horizontally align this like so. And then probably the rest of this area is going to be the melons. And I'm probably actually going to do them, in all honesty, I'm probably going to do them this way. So I have to do, yeah, that would be like this. This, and then this, and then this will be an empty row, I think. Because in all honesty, I would love to just keep rowing, you know, as much melons and as much food in here as possible. But I've learned this year, I grew so much food in this small of a space that it became impossible to film anything in there or to even really walk in here. So we need to have some sort of areas for walking. And even though this here is filled with cucumbers, this is actually going to, there is a walkway here. There will be a walkway here for sure. But what's nice about this is that you can fit basically, you know, two melons in each of these things, right? Um, because each melon needs one and a half square foot. Same thing with the cucumbers if you're growing them vertically, whereas each of the tomatoes can afford one square foot. Um, so that's what we'll do. I, this is a lot of room for melons, but I really want to have as many melons as possible. Maybe even plant them out in two different... Nah, I want to get them in as early as I can. Hmm. Yeah, and I want to grow them vertically. So th I think this is really the best I can do unfortunately but yeah this should work out really well um and this of course back here is a path for me this is one square foot so there's a lot of room here to walk which is good <laughs> and at the same time i'm going to be able to grow a ton of food and i don't know necessarily if there's anything else i really want to plant in the summer garden just because it's either all that, that i wanted is going to be either at the community garden or it's already here I don't think there's anything else that really needs a ton of attention. You know, really doesn't take up a whole lot of room, and I don't know. Let's just go through this list and see if there is anything else. And my other thought, we didn't actually, I forgot about one thing. I'm going to go back to that in a minute. Mm. Yeah, none of this seems that appealing or like we're having an issue here or something like that. Um, right. I think one thing I'm thinking about growing is some tomatillos yeah there's a tomatillo variety did forget about that that you can eat fresh um, if you wanted and also would be good in a um, a salsa blanking on the name of that we're gonna have to find out what the name of that variety is and um, and grow that one Hmm. What is Mabuna? What the heck? Yeah, I think that's it. I think that is it here, guys. Um What is this? Early Mabuna. Under the radar culinary gem, Mambuna is one of the lesser known of the Dento Yasai. Buttery tender mild green. It's a salad green. Looks pretty good, honestly. 
Maybe it's similar to Mizuna, and that's why they call it Mabuna. It kind of looks similar to Mabu uh, Mizuna. What a weird name. Um, <laughs> what do you guys think else I should grow? Because we've got the Tomatillo not doing the ground cherries this year. wasn't impressed. The eggplants, the tomatoes, the cucumbers, the melons. And then over here in the community garden, we have the corn, zucchini, we have the potatoes, we have the onions somewhere. We have the beans, and I mean all kinds of beans, just tons of beans. Um, and then if you go back to the uh, the actual garden, I think what I want to do is actually reserve some area here for things like broccoli. And that could be a huge mistake. <laughs> Just because I need all this room for the melons, I guess. Um, hmm. Hmm. Maybe I should select some of these tomatoes and put them in the community garden. Well, we're gonna have to arrange this here, guys, on my own time. But that's necessary. That's pretty much everything right there. Um, you know what I'm going to do, actually? I think I'm going to go back to the, the row by row people. I forget the name. Oh, Haas Tools. That's them. So I'm going to go on Haas Tools, and I'm going to see some of their podcasts and things, see what they're growing, because they, they do a really good job of that. I'm sure some of you guys may even watch them. Um, I know my friend Brian does. Um... They had a, they gave me a couple ideas that I thought were pretty darn interesting, and we should I should grow them, you know. Uh, not on the okra train, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, what I also forgot here is that we forgot about all of the the squash, basically. Um, just totally forgot about all the squash. Um, so we're going to have to figure out where the squash is going to go because that's something I want to grow. I guess it's going to have to go in the community garden and grow it along the ground is really all it is. Um, I would even consider almost growing mostly squash there. I think that's roughly it here, guys. Um, yeah, it doesn't. Nothing else is really screaming at me here. So we're gonna definitely. Uh, we gotta really change this whole thing, huh? How much corn can I really grow? Maybe if I put this, you know, let's see. This is tough because I can't even. This has got to go. Something like that. But I can't drag this down. So... This has got to go, this has got to go, this has got to go. Mm, whatever. Um, no. No. The beans, these are dots of shield beans. We have to figure out what what's going on there. But this is going to have to be moved, is really what my thinking is, is to move this here. Wait, there, and then this then goes, hmm, and then in the middle here, on the, on the outer edges are squash, so something like this. 
be a squash. This could be a squash. I mean, these plants get massive. So the thing is, I don't want to. I don't want to plant too many of them. Either because they they can shade each other out and stuff. Uh, maybe even do one giant planting of squash there. You know what I mean. Cleaning this up, it's looking good. It's looking much better already. And then what happens is the corn is done at a certain point, and then this whole area gets taken over by the, the squash. And I have just a ton of squash to show for it at the end of the season. Uh, maybe you could even do a watermelon in here. But I'd rather do the squash, honestly. I think that seems more reliable. Because even if the squash doesn't do well, and that's kind of what happened with the summer garden this year, had all the melons underneath the underneath the, the corn, and then the the melons underneath the corn didn't really produce all that well and weren't very sweet because they didn't have that sunlight. They were shading each other out, and then once the corn came out of there, then it really started to shine. And by that time, it was sort of too late for the melons, but. It won't be too late almost for the squash. And plus, this is a much larger area. And in all honesty, I maybe even get away with, you know, something right here. Again, another one right here. And then what, would be, what I guess you could even do as well is plant some up towards here because when the potatoes are done, the onions will be, or the, when the potatoes and onions and zucchini and all this stuff here up here is done, the squash just come in and take over, and then that's the end of it. So I guess I could do this. Problem is, you know, this is going to definitely affect something here. You know, it's not going to be like. Yeah, I think we just do, like, this would be, this would be a row of potatoes. I hate how you can't move this. It's so annoying. So this could be a row of potatoes. And then this is then another one. And then back here is the onions. But then I have to figure out where my beans go. And maybe this is just not, maybe this is just too much, you know. Um, definitely the beans can go on the edges, but probably not enough room. Yeah. Plus, this is not, let's just take that out. Beans. Beans. But doesn't leave a whole lot of room for onions and and well, we don't need a ton of room for the zucchini. Doesn't leave a whole lot of room for onions. Oh, and then down here is another one. And I'm going to have to look up the right spacing for this stuff. Uh, there's definitely a spacing that I'm going to have to live by, and maybe that spacing is going to definitely affect this in some way. And maybe I can even move this down to two blocks and then give myself more room up here for onions and uh, things like that. Yeah, let's do that because this... This is definitely, yeah, that makes sense to me. And then this gets moved.
potatoes. And then somehow we need to get a row of onions in here. Uh, maybe instead I do... Maybe I'll do zucchini in the middle or something. Um, what is going on here? You should be able to paste the value. Okay, all right, whatever. All right, whatever there. And then this is just... Yeah, this, this makes a whole lot more sense to me. I'm sure it does to you guys as well. Anyone that's that can basically see this, but essentially I think now what we do... Yeah, we can just make this whole thing beans, and that's, I think, the end of it. And then each of these is some kind of squash, butternuts pumpkins, uh, kabocha squash, whatever it is that we want. Whatever it is here, guys. And even this, there's so much room here in the center that you, I guess you can make an argument that this, this could be zucchini up here. Hmm. This could be squash. And then maybe zucchini down here as well. Yeah. Well, that to me looks beautiful. And maybe even these guys up here, I can plant them a little bit later to give the potatoes and the onions and the beans a bit more time and then plant these. But, I mean, that's pretty solid, is it not? That looks uh, great. And, yeah, I'm really happy with that. I hope you guys were a little patient. Um, this is exactly how I think you guys should be doing it at home, uh, yourself. You know, make yourself one of these little charts. Um, you know, get into Excel or Google Drive, create a spreadsheet. Each little box represents uh, one square foot. You know, there's many different ways to do this, but this is kind of such an easy way to just move stuff around and figure this out, have a plan so that when you go into the spring, it's just so easy. You just follow the plan. You know, you probably memorize it depending on how big your, your plots are. You know, some some of you guys just might have a giant plot like this, 30 by 30, and just grow one thing in the plot, you know. You may just have a ton of plots. So anyway, that was my little plants here for the year. We talked about the citrus, the strawberries. I hope everybody out there is uh, getting something out of this. What are you guys going to grow? Um, let me know if there's something I'm missing, something I should grow. We did miss, we did forget to mention the brassicas in this area here that I may just dedicate some room here to growing Brussels sprouts and broccoli and, and cabbage and things, but I'm not entirely sold on that just yet. Um, it's a tough one. They're, they're so good when you grow them. I mean, they're already good when you buy them at the store, but they're like on another level. If you can grow it yourself and eat that, it's like, whoa. Um, yeah. And they're probably the most nutritious food out of all of this. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um, I just see more land. You guys know that. Anyway, we'll talk to everybody soon. All right, take care, guys. I hope you, to see you guys for next week. You're staying happy. You're staying healthy. You all had a good Thanksgiving. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, catch you guys later, all right? Take care.